Welcome to the second day of Future Talk 2020 live from Bern, Switzerland. Good to have you all here. Also, a warm welcome to all our guests watching us online on YouTube or during our event app. My name is Dorothy Gelmar. I'm your host and moderator, and I'm looking forward to guide you through our conference. Yeah, yesterday, we have focused on STEAM and STEM education, and today it is green, also here in our event hall. It's about green education, and we have an action-packed program set up for you, for all our guests here in Bern, but also for you, wherever you are at the moment. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Yeah, if you have already participated in yesterday's event, then you know that this is a hybrid dialogue event where our panelists join us on site here in Bern or via Zoom call from wherever in the world. Yesterday we've been to the Philippines and so on. Um, my name is Dorothy Gamar. I'm happy to be here and I'm sure we will have a great day all together and interesting talks, interesting panels. We have two panel discussions here, the private sector talk and so on. Yeah, for all of you taking part from the home office or office, if you want to share your thoughts, maybe some statements, or if you have any questions, please use the hashtag FutureTalk2020. Yeah, as this is also an interactive event, we want interaction with all of you. If you use YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, please use the comment function for sending us your um, questions, for example, or your statements. If you use the Hoover app, which you can download uh, through our internet uh, web, web page, uh, futuretalk.org, um, there you can also post your questions and I will hand them over to our panelists uh, at the end of our panel talk. We also have prepared a poll. Uh, it's a lot of fun and you can check your knowledge there. We will reveal the answers at the end of today. Yeah, now I would say let's start this afternoon uh, with the Vice President of World Didac, Mr. Nader Imani, and here he is. Hello, Nader. <laughs> Thank you, Doro. Um, excellencies, um, partners, and representatives from the world of politics, business and education, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the globe. The green economy offers the opportunity for significant growth in societies by working in line with the ecology, not against it. It represents the culmination of sustainable development goals altogether. This statement could be drawn from evidence of policy progress, as well as the insight of civil society organizations who are tracking environment-friendly measures on the ground. Nonetheless, the worldwide economy is still excessively reliant on fossil fuel-based energy, transport, and carbon-intensive industries. With a large share of, of the world force currently unemployed, these sectors are quite simply failing to secure and create enough jobs. The brown economy model is struggling and does not provide us the sustainability we all need to safeguard the planet we borrowed from the next generations, yet to be born. What will be the aspiration and the robust foundation that the world should have on which to build a green and equitable economy? For the, time, for the first time in COP21 in 2016, worldwide governments, together with the business, trade unions, and civil society organizations, adopted the Paris Agreement on Climate to set a global target for the world, reducing or at least maintaining a global carbon emissions. This has been offering for the first time an opportunity to all countries, particularly the most industrialized ones, the prospect to make the change where economy, ecology, and society match in symbiosis altogether. As a matter of fact, we need governments, all government, governments, to politically support such an accord to transform an agreement to a movement. The recent policy derived by the EU presidency of Mrs. von der Leyen 
that Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050 gives us, the expert technocrats and decision makers, hope for the future and call for actions. Green economy will be an inspirational model for the future and green jobs, the backbone for it. Green skills, or better said, greening skills, are required to create jobs and support the green economy, reflecting the journey we will all need urgently to embark on. Making our planet ready for the future, sustainable, to regenerate itself. I'm extremely pleased to host our keynote speakers today and our panelists for a future fruitful day on how our education system should be answering the challenge of greening our economy. Thank you for your participation and the great interest. Thanks, Mr. Imani, for the welcoming words. And as you see, we have a safety concept here for all our guests joining us here in Bern. We wear masks, we have the distance, we keep the distance, so we all stay safe and healthy. Let's now move on to our Swiss government representative for the session, Mrs. Liliana Kirchknopf. She is the head of private sector development at the SECO, the Economic Development Corporation of Switzerland. And Liliana is also the co-chair of the Global Donor Committee on Enterprise Development. Hello, Liliana. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, dear Excellencies, uh, dear Ambassador He Rang Kong, dear Director So Yang Choi, dear Mr. von Grafenried, Mayor of Bern, experts, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you today, present or virtually, wherever you are, on behalf of the Swiss government to the second day of future talk dedicated to green education in partnership with UNESCO UNEVOC. The COVID context in which we come together is a reminder that there is an urgency in this regard. Switzerland, as many other countries, is committed to the goals of the Paris Agreement to stay below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to thereby fight the threat of climate change. The Parliament has recently adopted a T CO2 law to have a basis for implementing the necessary measures. Emissions should be halved by 2030 and Switzerland is to become climate neutral by 2050. While there is a consensus on the overall goal, the different measures needed are still being disputed by different parties. And therefore, a referendum is likely. That's why today's discussion is so important to identify how we all and together from the public and the private sector can accelerate the green transition by strengthening green education and providing the relevant skills. To have an overall framework is also useful. In Switzerland, the Federal Council has defined a sustainable development strategy, which is aligned with the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. It focuses on consumption and production, energy, climate and biodiversity and equal opportunities. It is currently being widely consulted before being adopted. This summer, the Swiss government adopted a report and guidelines on sustainability in the financial sector. As we know, the financial sector plays an important role in this respect in the green transition. The aim is to make Switzerland a leading location for sustainable financial services. And it is just this week that the State Secretariat for International Finance has launched the Green FinTech Network. This brings me to my role at SECO, the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, and more precisely at the Economic Cooperation and Development Division. Our mandate is to support our partner countries, mostly middle-income countries, such as South Africa or Indonesia, 
in fighting poverty through growing sustainably and in an inclusive manner. Climate-friendly grow is thereby one of four goals of our current strategy and we have devoted about a fourth of our funds to it. Furthermore, the goal of more and better jobs has been an important part of SECO's work. Indeed, poor countries, in poor countries getting a job is one of the main reasons why people are able to rise out of poverty and to meet this goal SECO promotes the development of skills with a focus on higher education that improve labor productivity and competitiveness in specific sectors. Climate change is increasingly becoming a factor to consider when developing skills projects. For instance, fr climate friendly business can create millions of new jobs in the next years, but for this, well-targeted and well-designed support is required to allow businesses to grasp opportunities stemming from climate change. And at the same time, climate change represents a high risk in terms of job destruction, in particular for the most vulnerable. As a response, more and more implementing organizations have started to cover climate or environmental issues embedded in a skills project. The ILO, a key partner of SECO in various projects, has been very active in this area by undertaking relevant research and promoting the greening of enterprises, workplace practices, and the labor market as a whole. And now let me mention some concrete examples of what SECO is doing. We have launched several programs to support greening of the financial sector by providing specific trainings to financial institutions on sustainable finance, ESG risks and aspects, environmental, social and government aspects, and in general, the design and launch of green financial products. This again has a great impact on the real economy. In Switzerland, Swiss Sustainable Finance has been a strategic partner in this agenda and we have supported them to establish in 2014. Greening the construction sector is another priority um, of us as the construction sector accounts for 28% of energy related greenhouse gases. We have achieved tremendous success by collaborating with the IFC International Finance Corporation as part of the World Bank Group to create a green building certification system adapted to emerging markets. The EDGE, Excellence in Design for Great Efficiencies system, has leveraged more than 4 billion investments from IFC and mobilized financing from other banks for green buildings. SECO's role was to provide seed, fun seed funding for this innovative and system-relevant approach. The support included also close collaboration with universities in order to promote relevant skills in partner countries. My last example concerns South Africa, the Green Skills Project, um, where we support the strategy of the South African government to establish training for qualified skilled labor that is geared towards the need of businesses and industry taking green elements into consideration. Now going forward, SECO will increasingly mainstream climate change aspects in skills development projects. And we will be aiming at fostering the dualization of the vocational education and training, taking into consideration critical sectors or companies and shifting them to respective curricula and study programs towards a more environmental and climate-friendly production. This may include sectors such as textiles, wood, processing, food, agriculture, or tourism. Our work, uh, let me say, is coordinated with other donors and partners, and we learn from each other and we also complement each other. One mechanism to which we are doing this is the DCD, as has been mentioned, the Donor Committee on Enterprise Development, which I'm co-chairing, and which brings together different donors, um, international organization and private foundations. And one of the working groups is dedicated to green growth. 
But then there are other fora, um, some we will hear today, and also the Donor Committee for, do for Dual Vocational Education and Training, the DC DVET, focusing on the education and skills development side in German-speaking countries. Today is a great opportunity to hear and get inspired what different countries, international organizations, companies, academia and associations are doing on green education. Mr. von Grafenried, Mayor of Bern from the Green Party, will conclude the day by sharing the views of learning and greening cities approach and hopefully those present uh, physically in Bern will have an opportunity to discover some of these aspects during their stay. Once again, a warm welcome to Bern and to the second day of Future Talk on Green Education. Thank you so much, Ms. Kirchknopf for these insights in SECO, for your great work, for making the world a bit greener and better. Thank you very much for everything. Yeah, let's continue right away with our embassy host of today, Korea, and the ambassador of the Republic of Korea in Switzerland, represented today by Minister Councillor La of the Korean Embassy, joining us live. On behalf of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in Switzerland, I would like to say that it is a great pleasure and honor for the Embassy to participate in the 2020 World DIDA Conference Future Talk as a host. Education has always been one of the key pillars for sustainable and inclusive growth, not only for each nation, but also for the entire global community. And I believe that current COVID situation has only accentuated the critical role of education for future growth. Education was instrumental in catapulting South Korea from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the most advanced nations within a short span of the last 50 years. I'm pleased to note that Korea is number one in the world with 70.4% of high school graduates entering college. Thanks to highly educated and well-trained labor force, Korea had successfully and rapidly transitioned to the second, third, and fourth industrial revolution and now ranks as a ninth largest country in global trade. Mindful of the importance of education for her own sustainable growth, Korea has steadfastly strove to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities, not only for Korean nationals, but also uh, for people around the world. This year alone, Korea is providing 260 million US dollars in overseas development aid on education in order to improve educational facilities and programs, provide vocational training, equipments and materials to various developing countries. Korea is also actively participating in such global educational initiatives as Global Education First Initiative, spearheaded by former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Also, UN Academic Input, Impact, as well as the UNDPI NGO Conference, which came up with the Global Education Action Agenda in 2016 during the meeting held in Korea. And I am proud to say that Korea's commitment to improve and enhance education around the world will not cease even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And my embassy's participation in today's conference is another example of such dedication. I'd like to thank all the participants and staff for making the conference possible. And I'm certain that this event will lay a lasting impact 
on future of education and sustainable growth. Thank you. Mr. Councillor La of the Korean Embassy, thank you so much. UNIVOC is UNESCO's designated center for technical and vocational education and training, TVET, and we are looking forward to the director of UNESCO UNIVOC, Zhu Yang Choi. Distinguished guest participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you in Europe and good morning and good evening to those joining from other parts of the world. First, I would like to thank World Didac for inviting UNESCO UNEVOC to this conference focused on the impact that education can make on the transition to green and inclusive growth. It is our pleasure to partner with you in organizing a session on green education, which is one of our priorities, and we look forward to our continuing collaboration in the future. Today, I would like to highlight some pedagogical issues facing green education for Tibet and the implication of COVID-19 and digitalization on the topic. I hope that they serve as a good food for thought and a background for the discussions scheduled today with the panelists and the audience. First of all, something special about Tibet and green education. These two topics have one thing in common. That is that they both are shared responsibilities of many different actors and stakeholders. Coordinating different actors and stakeholders has been the main challenge both for Tibet and for green education respectively. Now imagine the complexity of the coordination issue when it comes to green education for Tibet combined. Green education for Tibet is the job of many, not only educational institutions, but also workplaces, not only the government sector, but also the private sector, not only the education ministries, but also the ministries responsible for environment, economy, trade, and or industry. But this multi-sectoral ownership can also mean that green education for Tibet runs the risk of becoming the job of nobody. Countries have set up all kinds of coordination mechanisms to prevent the fragmentation. According to a 2019 ILO study, countries in fact have been relatively successful in setting up the mechanisms and frameworks for intersectoral collaboration and coordination to promote green skills. But both developed and developing countries fall far short of implementing actions or monitoring the impact of their actions on green skills. Action, that is the word that matters most when it comes to green education for Tibet. UNESCO looked into the question of how a sustained real action for greening or sustainable development is undertaken by individuals. Action for greening or sustainable development does not happen simply by acknowledging the need for greening, developing well-intentioned policies and mechanisms, or introducing the state-of-the-art delivery means. The real and sustained actions for greening requires a transformation, a fundamental change in the entity's belief and value system. Such a disruptive change does not happen for no reason, unless there is something impacting the entity's own life existence or survival. For green education for Tibet to be effective, it has to be intrinsically linked to one's life. It has to bear relevance to one's livelihood. This is where green voices are excited about the rare window of opportunity created inadvertently by COVID-19. People and institutions all of a sudden have been thrown into a world where they experience, among others, the viability of living, working, and learning differently. In other words, digitally, in a less carbon-intensive manner. Some governments like South Korea and Australia have announced concrete measures to make their COVID-19 recovery process much greener. Some companies have made a bold decision to transition towards digital workplaces, either completely or partially. With the COVID-19, actions have taken place in a way that was never imagined to be possible. It was possible because we experienced something that we can verify in our own lives. 
Ironically, this is where the biggest challenge lies for green education to be delivered effectively in a digital manner. To begin with, TIVET, which often requires a practical in-person training, is uniquely challenging to deliver via digital platforms. In order to deliver green education for TVET digitally, it must be contextualized. It has to touch upon the immediate green need of the community of the learners, the particular green skills required in the community, the particular green industrial networking available in the community. Otherwise, green education for TVET delivered digitally can be far removed from the reality in which the learners are based. Even if all these recommendations are honored for green education for Tibet to be delivered effectively via digital means there is one particular challenge that is quite daunting to overcome. That is the greening is one of the areas where we have the most serious competency issue for teachers. And now the problem is further compounded by the teacher's urgent training need for digital delivery. I understand that there will be a discussion today on digitalization and its impact on and promises for green education. In doing so, let's not forget about the Tibet teachers being called upon to rapidly pick up all the new learnings and deliver the necessary future-oriented training to their students. Thank you, and I wish you a very successful discussion. So thanks for your encouraging words, Minister Councillor La of the Korean Embassy. No, that's not right, Mrs. Su Choi, I'm so sorry, the di director of the UNESCO UNIVOC. So let's now go on with our next speaker, a gentleman who joined us already yesterday and thrilled us, the whole uh, people here around and also in front of our uh, cameras, um, the futurist Mr. Leonard. He thrilled us with his forecast concerning the STEM education in the era of the new normal. And today he will focus on green education. Here he is. Hi, it's Gerd Leonhardt, Futurist again with a second session for Future Talks in beautiful Bern. I hope you had a good time yesterday and I gave you some food for thought. Today, I'm going into the second session to talk about what I sometimes call the green futures and how that hangs together with education. So let's dive right in. First, as I said yesterday, you know, we are approaching uh, another wave of reality, which is beyond the COVID crisis, which is still keeping us very busy and hopefully will be wrapped up sometime next year. Uh, the next one, the next real challenge and also opportunity is climate change. And it has been around for a long time, of course, but now we're saying, well, if we made sacrifices and we changed how we do things in the COVID crisis, can we do the same when it's about climate change and global warming? The reality is that uh, COVID-19 is just a test run for climate change. That is in terms of impact, in terms of uh, urgency, but it's just a little bit slower. So we have a hard time understanding what's coming in 40 years. Or, But rest assured, it will all happen in 10 years to a substantial impact of issues, which I'll talk about shortly, if we don't take action now. Again, like I said earlier, we're at a pivot point, at a fork in the road, where we have to take action or uh, result in consequences, for example, as we did in COVID, but we weren't ready and we weren't ready to make those changes here in Switzerland. We are very lucky that we were uh, to a large degree of many other countries like the US and Brazil. Yeah, there's a lot of suffering because of this. And the key question when we think about that future of climate change and global warming, this is a scene from San Francisco just uh, four weeks ago when there was wildfires all over California, the biggest ones ever. Um, the key question that people keep asking me about the future is this one, you know, what will the future bring? And that is not a good question because the future isn't fixed. It doesn't just happen and made in Silicon Valley or China or wherever you think in s at CERN or wherever. Right? The key question for us is when we think about education and our kids in the future is what future we want. Because right? we have a choice. Right? We can have scenes like this every week all over the world or we can do something. And we can be prepared for artificial intelligence. We can be prepared for uh, the end of fossil fuel and we have to make those choices and we have to think about what kind of skills and education we need. As I was saying earlier, yeah, yesterday, we are in warp drive into the future and here's four things that are happening that are going to require different thinking. First is big tech. Everything is about technology. 
So technical skills and understanding technology is becoming crucial. We have to teach it our kids, we have to teach it ourselves. And I think this is not about programming, it's about understanding what technology does and what the options are. Big health, clearly everything is about healthcare, wellness, well-being, food, that is exploding and trillions of euros are going to shift in that direction in public funding. We have big state, the state is mingling with everything and that's sometimes good as it is here in Switzerland for the most part and sometimes not so good as it is in Brazil and other countries who are more hard hit. Uh, but of course most people don't like big states so this may be a little bit temporary but here's the biggest one, huh? big green. Because now we're saying, you know what? COVID is, was an emergency and now the next wave is global change, climate change and global warming and energy and sustainability. That is the big area that we need to focus on, not just because we must focus on it, also because it's a new economy. I think the World Economic Forum has said 395 million new jobs if we invest in nature. Right? An interesting point of view, I think, that we need to look at and say, well, going back to what I said yesterday about Buckminster Fuller, uh, the future is a choice between utopia and oblivion. We can make that choice now. The next 10 years will be that choice and our kids will have to live with that choice. Uh, and as we're seeing right now, this is essentially a pivoting moment where we look at everything like inequality, right? Where we look at uh, economic systems, we look at climate change and of course COVID and pandemics, right? And we are turning, we need to turn the world around. We need to act. We need to come up with new rules, norms, social contracts, solidarity. This is a time of reset. And the skills we need from us, from our kids, from our employees, from people with us, right? They are about imagination. They're about storytelling, about negotiation. They are all ephemeral skills right? and character traits. Um, Einstein once said imagination is more important than knowledge. I think that's all very much about knowledge, <laughs> but, anyway, but imagination is what we need to create that future. Um, and on that note, I think really what's happening is it's totally clear right now th is that sustainability is no longer about just a nice to have or afterthought after we have dinner, uh, steak dinner. Uh, it's, it's not an ideology, it's not altruism, it's the business plan for humanity. It is the way that we're going to go forward in the future and say, well, this is how we can survive and prosper. And this is what's happening right now. So education in that area is going to be crucial. If you're looking at just the numbers, of course, this does not make for a very good dinner conversation, whether it's the anonym anonymies or CO2 emissions or the climate map of the future with 300 million climate refugees coming to Europe including Switzerland. Right? So it's something that we must act on. I think it's totally clear we are in a future where that is becoming crucial for us to understand the circular economy. Again, been much talked about for a long time, but I think in 2030, the only economy there is will be a circular economy. That is the only thing that we're going to have because that's the only thing that will be useful for us uh, without destroying what we like. Right? And the unthinkable will become the new normal, including carbon tax on airplanes, carbon tax on meats, uh, carbon tax on, of course, taking a regular car uh, and feeding that back in the system, cutting out the fossil fuel subsidies. That's all on the agenda. And what do we have to learn for this? Well, we have to learn a lot of negotiation, a, l a lot of uh, interpersonal skills, a lot of emotional intelligence, a lot of things that, that are coming together. So we're going through this window in this future. I mean, we're clearly going into a new time and thus we need a new agenda for education. Yes, science, technology, of course, we have to understand, but in the end, right, these are human-only skills. Intuition, foresight, creativity, design, understanding, uh, communication, development. Uh, these are all things that computers can maybe simulate eventually, but the hacky skills, uh, the ethics, creativity, those are skills that we're going to see as human-only skills. And as Klaus Schwab keeps saying, you know, th this time right now, the pandemic creates a rare and narrow opportunity to reimagine what we want from the world and to re reimagine education. <laughs> uh, again, what world will we live, leave to our kids and how they're going to be equipped to deal with this world? Because yeah, in 10 years, 9 billion people on the internet uh, half of the jobs will be virtual or in the cloud. Uh, so clearly this is a key development that's happening. I think we're moving away from the fossil fuel economy. That's roughly uh, uh, 
I think 10 million people work in the fossil fuel economy. Now we're moving to away from that into the renewable uh, fuel economy, and I think this is really quite a huge shift in every possible way. I call it the people, planet, purpose, prosperity economy, or the green economy, the sustainable economy. And that is a huge opportunity, especially for Switzerland, especially for international organizations, because it's a business model that is sustainable and that should lead to a uh, good scenario in the future. And many, many new jobs from research to design uh, to everything else in this new food chain, replacing the old food chain of fossil fuel uh, and fossil fuel subsidies. That is going to be a very big deal, especially for those millennials that I'm showing you here, because the share of population uh, is going to increase. All right, and right now we're still sort of around this, the Generation X and the baby boomers. They're still making a good chunk, but you know, right now it's already exploding. So roughly around now it's already at 41% or so, but basically the future is going to be owned by the Gen X and the Gen Zs. You know, the kids are now between 12 and 35. That's going to be an entirely different scenario. We have to help them to understand this future because clearly they are going to be the ones in control of business and governments and as we see around the world, uh, also taken over governments. Um, like you know, in New Zealand we have, of course, the Sindhu Ardern isn't quite a millennial, <laughs> but, but a lot closer than I am to this. And they're going to have to juggle this 2030 landscape, big tech, big health, big state. And here's what they really have to juggle, that is the big green. That is the most fundamental thing that we need to look at. And this is, n again, it's not just because we have to, but because we have an opportunity there to do a reset in the next 10 years. After that, I think uh, we will get to the place where we wish we would have done a reset. <laughs> so global paradigm shifts all over the place. That's what we can expect in the next 10 years. Decisive action on climate change, it will be painful, it will hurt, but it will also create lots of new work. It will shift the money from oil and gas and weapons and whatever we are currently are investing in. Uh, not Aramco, but Grimco, so to speak. Right? <laughs> Decisive action on climate change, that is coming. A renewed focus on healthcare and social and education. Also many, many new jobs in alternative medicine, personalized, customized medicine, and education, of course, as the key component of dealing with that new future challenge. Um, a rise of diverse young and female leaders, and we have already seen that the, the female leaders of the world have fared much better in the COVID crisis. Uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, uh, Iceland, and of course Germany. And we're going to see a lot more of that, and we will see populism die because the performance has been absolutely miserable, as evidenced in the US. But more technology everywhere, right? And basically, technology is going to run everything because it's becoming smart and, and cheap and powerful. But we're also going to see more tech lash. You know, people are going to say, well, you know, we want technology to be controlled. So look for technology regulation in the next couple of years. We may see less globalization because of the supply chain issues that every company is looking at. But we're going to see also more global collaboration because only with multilateralism can we actually solve the large problems like security, safety, water, food, disease, and so on. Right? So in a nutshell, this is where we're going also in the context of, of the green future and the, uh, the green deals that are happening around the world. Skills on two levels, and the STEM levels and the HECI levels, uh, and they're going to be much more on par, as they much more than they have been so far. I think we're going to see a return to humanistic uh, education also at many uh, colleges and schools, in including, of course, uh, art and design and sports and music and ethics and philosophy, uh, because that is what machines can't do. Right? We're going to do what machines can't do, and we're going to really change the way that we look at this. EQ and IQ, right? In the world's fight against coronas, Female leaders show the way. That was from April this year, and it's still true. Let me give you a short quote from my favorite uh, person, the quote from uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. If I could distill it down into one concept that we are pursuing in New Zealand, it is simple, and it is this. Kindness. Yeah, I imagine as a principle of government, kindness. Right? That sounds like EQ, doesn't it? I think we're going to need a lot more of that. And how do we do create this? Well. We have to create the environment for it. We have to create the openness for it, the possibility for it. So that wraps up the second take on uh, the green future and education. I'm going a little bit closer. Tomorrow I'll go on a little bit longer 
uh, on uh, the remaining topics of artificial intelligence, the future of work, and other such minor topics. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you're having a good time at the event, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard, for this inspiration and for the food for thoughts, which will certainly accompany us in the talks and in the next situations happening here in our future talk. Ladies and gentlemen, find out more about our speakers, about our panelists and experts on our futuretalk.org website or also in our event app. And don't forget to share your thoughts, your comments, your statements by using the hashtag FutureTalk2020. Now, take a breath. We're back in some moments and maybe think about the thoughts of Future Talk we shared in the last minutes. See you back at two. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Future Talk 2020. Let's go on with the next point on our agenda. I'm very honored to welcome our next guest who is joining us via Zoom call. It's Mr. Avi Khan from Hilti. Hilti, a global leader providing innovative tools, technology, software, and services to the commercial construction industry. And the gentleman we will now meet is territory sales representative. And today he serves as a member of Hilti's executive board. And he is joining us via Zoom. Hello, Avi Khan. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Where are you located at the moment? Well, for me, it's actually good morning because I'm located in Dallas in the USA. Okay, then grab a coffee and let's talk about green education. I hope you had sure. breakfast already. <laughs> yes, thank you. Mr. Khan, let's start uh, with the first question I'd like directly uh, to hand over to you. How does Hilti implement the UN sustainability goals as a company? Yeah, of course, uh, for Hilti, we are an almost 80-year-old company. Sustainability is an important part of what we do. It's first and foremost embedded in our mission statement because we talk about passionately creating enthusiastic customers and building a better future. And building a better future talks a lot about our involvement in the community and our commitment to sustainability. In the global eco value sustainability rating, we're already in the top 13% of companies, but we want to continuously push that forward. And next year, we will communicate for the first time a sustainability report to share also with the public how we bring the sustainability goals to life and how we measure them. Mm -hmm. How do you think is Silti seen from an employer's and a customer's perspective when it comes to this important thing to environmental issues? Yeah, we know that for our employees, it's very important uh, to know what the company that they work for does and what type of footprint does it leave on the environment. We every year do an employee survey uh, to check the satisfaction of our people. 80% of our team members respond favorably to the question, uh, does Hilti act in an environmentally conscious and responsible way? So we're happy about that, but also we get many comments. We have 30,000 team members, and in the later survey, we had 19,000 comments, many of them related to the environment, to green education, to green activities, so we know we can and we do plan to do much more. From the customer perspective, we know that it goes in two directions. One, customers want to partner with companies that are acting in a responsible way, and they ask us questions, they want to know our statistics, they want to know our reporting. That's at a company level. But we also know that at the product level, Customers want to know the ingredients of a product, the risk of a product. What is the afterlife of that product? Does it get recycled? Does it get reused? So in both perspectives, we have efforts and concentrate our actions. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned the product development. Maybe we can focus on that a bit more. What role does sustainability play in that case? So how uh, is, is a change in the product development? Yes, yeah, sustainability has had a big change on our product development uh, in recent years. First of all, uh, we now take ecological aspects into account already when developing the products. And um, we have tools, we have also uh, chemical products that we sell. So we look at those chemical substances. Are there 
alternative sources and alternative production materials uh, and technologies that would reduce the impact on the environment or introduce a safer product to produce. We then have to think about the user health and safety of the people using our products. So can we have label free product? Can we have as much as possible products that are safe to use? And is there an opportunity already in product development to think about the second life of that product, the recyclability, the reusability and circ circulability of that product? And last but not least, we have more and more customers because we operate in construction that think about aspects of green building. And with that, we try to support them as much as possible with the proper products into those type of projects. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your workforce skilled in digitalization? We actually are going through a digital transformation at the moment uh, as a company. And um, we have both internal and external efforts in that area to keep our people skilled. Over the eight decades of history at Hilti, one of our success factors has been the ability to bring people along when we make changes. And we want to do the same now in the digital age. So we invest heavily into skilling existing team members, into equipping them to be successful in the new world. For example, we just launched a new customer relationship management system together with Salesforce, and we have a six month long process where we train every single sales person in the company to use this new digital system and be successful also in the new world. You also mentioned the role of circularity. Um, can you um, dive more into this topic? How does uh, circularity play a role in your company? Um, what projects are going on in that case? Sure. Well, circularity, our belief is now in the forefront and recycling, which was already a good thing, you know, on average, 8.6% of raw material are used out of uh, recycled products worldwide. That's not a bad statistics. I'm proud to share with you that for us at Hilti, it's actually already at 25%. Uh, so we're, we're proud about that and we try to do whatever we can to use recycled materials. But circularity has, of course, many more benefits to the environment where products can be reused again, where products can find a second life. Because we are a direct sales organization, worldwide Hilti works directly with the end user, with the contractor, we have that direct link and we have the ability to collect our products, for example, our tools at the end of our life. We have uh, usage programs. Uh, our fleet management program provides the tools to the customers. They use it for a number of years and then we collect it back. And that allows us then using also our in-house network of repair centers. We have 65 repair centers around the world with 800 of our own technicians to find a second life uh, for those products. So while um, recycling is a great thing, which we do internally and we encourage in all of our projects. We believe circularity will now play a much bigger role. As I said before, we will try to design our products with that in mind and continuously look for opportunities to reuse parts, reuse end products in a second terms to give them a second life. Mm -hmm, great. What does Hilti do for society? Do you have more insights in that case? Sure. As a company, we are strongly committed to that, as I said before, to building a better future. The way we really bring it to life is through the Hilti Foundation. Hilti is a family-owned company by the Hilti family, still today based in Liechtenstein. And what we do is jointly with the family, the company funds the Hilti Foundation that has many projects focused on society. We focus primarily on affordable housing, on economic empowerment for disadvantaged people, and on social change and education through music. We have projects all over the world, sometimes with our customers, sometimes with our team members that really aim to build a better future and to improve the situation in society. A couple of things that are maybe of interest to share as a private sector perspective. 
Even as a private for-profit organization, we give team members around the world, for example, in Germany, in the mm -hmm. USA, days paid to go and do something for society, to go and do something positive for the environment. And we spend tens of millions of dollars on these initiatives with the Hilti Foundation every year because we believe we as a company also need to play a part in building a better future. That's the most important thing, Avi. Great that you're Absolutely. supporting, supporting uh, yeah, the world, the people like this. Um, so we're um, on the front door to the new normal, the new era of the new normal. What are the effects um, of the era of the new normal for your business? Of course, like all companies, we are not spared uh, from the impact of uh, this new normal. When we realized that times were changing and, and things were happening, we uh, enacted our actions with three priorities in mind. First and foremost, we wanted to keep our team members safe. And we had many efforts in this area and still do until today for distancing, for the way they work, for giving them all the protective equipment that they need. We also wanted to stay close to our customers, and that's perhaps the biggest impact for a company like us. Um, we sell direct, as I said before, we go to job sites, we go to offices around the world, and in many cases that is only possible by appointment today. In some cases it's not possible at all, and we use means just like that, Zoom and others, to meet and interact with our customers also digitally. and. We are a company that builds an internal culture that meets together, that works together, and we had to shift a lot of those activities to online. What we are finding is many of these activities can happen in a digital way, and because we have invested over so many years to build into a strong culture at Hilti, we are benefit benefiting from that now. And maybe the last thought I would share maybe it's relevant for other companies we made the decision not to make long-term determinations mm -hmm. about policy and about work setup out of a pandemic perspective so will we all work only from home in the future or mm -hmm. come fully to the old way of working from the office probably neither of these extremes but we don't want to make the decision now we want to manage this situation where many countries have restrictions on where you can go and how you can gather and give all the flexibility to our people. And when the pandemic is over, really make smart decisions on flexible work arrangements, on work from home, maybe even work from anywhere, the new buzzword. Mm. But we will do that when the pandemic is over. Mm. So no long term, term, more short term decisions. That makes sense, even if we don't know what's happening tomorrow, next week, next year. Yeah. yeah, we learned we have to be very flexible in these yeah. times and yeah. things change from day to day or week to week. Um, restrictions on travel, for example, yeah. restrictions on the movement of people and goods, and mm -hmm. you have to stay flexible, you, you have to respond. But we believe there is room for more flexibility, for more work from home. We know that our team members in many cases appreciated that, they appreciated the additional flexibility and the work-life balance. But equally, we have people that are very eager to come back into uh, an office environment. Mm. Maybe they have kids at home. Yeah, Maybe yeah. they miss interacting with their colleagues. So we want to balance that out and, and then make those decisions. That we hopefully can decide what we want on our own. Uh, but this uh, will take some more days, some more weeks or months to go. Um, let's talk about uh, your workforce for greening education. Um, what are your next plans for skilling them up? Yeah, we see a real opportunity in ensuring our team members understand the impact that we as a company, but also them as an individual can have on the environment and how their decisions impact uh, all of us for many, many years to come. Um, a current initiative that we're running that really had to do a lot with education is involving our cars. Because we have thousands of people out seeing customers, we also have thousands of vehicles around the world. And of course, that's no secret, vehicles create a certain negative impact on the environment. What we try to do is educate our people what is the 
carbon footprint of each and every vehicle and in each of every decision that we make and making sure the environmental aspects of our vehicles are indeed part of that decision, what will be our car fleet of the future. Of course, we need to take it in balance with the infrastructure that's available in a country. In some countries, using electrical vehicles is really a viable option because the charging stations are there, then the infrastructure is there. In some countries, it should be natural gas, in some countries, other solutions. So it's just one example what we find when we give our people the tools and the knowledge to take a decision that takes a holistic view. Yes, of course, the economic aspects of that decision, we, we need to be mindful of that, but really understanding the opportunity that they have to have a positive impact on the environment, our people respond in such a positive way. So also in the private sector, there is an opportunity to improve the education and the awareness of people in a way that informs their decisions. Hmm. What do you think are the skills the new generation needs uh, from your point of view? Well, I would answer a question in two ways. When it comes specifically to green education, I see in our, the new generation joining our workforce, I see a lot of passion. I see a lot of knowledge. They are self-educating in this area. And that's why I believe many of them join Hilti because they want to work for a company where they can identify with our purpose and with our statement and really be a part of building a better future. Uh, they are well-educated. They are, of course, very digital savvy. The new workforce, they're very mobile. So for a company like us, that's very attractive. We need to make sure all of our people and especially all of our leaders are aware of not only our sustainability efforts, but the impact we expect to have. And mm. then the most critical thing is that then when they make decisions on a new manufacturing plant, on a new product, that the environment is an important aspect that they take. And then the second way I would answer your question is something that is probably obvious to all of us, but we invest heavily into that, and that's the success of our people in the digital age. We have an average tenure of more than 12 years at Tilti. So even though we have grown and added many people, we have people that have been with us for years and decades. Mm. And we believe in diversity, also generational diversity. And we want to make sure all generations in our workforce can be successful. And we invest heavily into the skills that they need to also be successful in the digital age. You have a huge responsibility at Hilti as a member um, of the board. Um, so putting profitability in relation to sustainability goals, how do you view this for the future? Yeah, we really want to find ways where the two are not in competition. For example, in the example I just gave with the vehicles, for example, we are finding solutions that are better for the environment, but are also economically better for us because we will save on our fuel costs, we will save on our maintenance costs. In manufacturing, we find that in some cases using uh, environmentally friendly technologies like solar, for example, in the long run will actually save us money. So the first and foremost thing we want to do is make sure as much as possible, there's not a conflict between the two. Because we are a decentralized company and we empower our leaders to make decisions, we want to reflect in the future whenever they create an impact on the environment, whenever an activity that they do creates a pollution, for example, that that is actually reflected in their result with a cost. And then they can make a decision whether that's the decision they want to make or not. Already today, we do our reporting according to the GRI initiative, and we want to enhance that and also allow our local business leaders in each country, in each unit, to make those trade-off decisions between economical decisions and the environment and bring that economic foot, the, uh, footprint that they make on the environment also into their economic decision making. One last question, Avi, um, we had a futurist, I don't know if you heard him the last uh, minutes, and um, he said COVID is a test run for climate change. 
What a statement. Um, what are your thoughts about this sentence? It, I think it's a, it's a strong statement, but I think what is for sure valid for all of us, we have to act. That's how we feel as a company. We operate in more than 100 countries, and of course the regulations and the interpretation of climate change and what it means in that country is very different. That is why we decided we don't want to wait for government regulations, but we want to take the responsibility of our, on our own to do our part, to avoid that climate change is leading to COVID-like impacts on us in the future. I'm not a futurist. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know that if we act today as individuals, as companies, and as a society, we do have an opportunity to reduce the impacts of climate change. And that is what is motivating us at Hilti to take action in this area. What a perfect ending of this very interesting talk. Avi Khan, member of the executive board at Hilti Group, thank you very much for your thoughts, for sharing your thoughts with us, with our audience, and, and for yeah, taking time, being part of Future Talk 2020. Yeah, All the thank best you for to having you. Me. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye-bye, Avi Khan. Bye.